My name is Susie, and this is Chuck, and we're here at Forest Park Nature Center, a Peoria Park District facility. Today, we're going to explore all the wonderful animals that are living right here beneath the soil. See them? Of course you don't see them. Regardless, a whole amazing habitat of creatures exists right here beneath our feet. Today, we're going to explore some of the adaptations of underground animals, like my friend right here, we are going to meet a couple live animals up close, and then we're going to explore some activities for learning more about the underground world. One thing I'd like us to clear up right away is the difference between dirt and soil. Do you know the difference? If so, give yourselves a pat on the back. When we talk about dirt, usually we mean stuff that we don't want to have on our bodies. Like, ew, Chuck, you're full of dirt. Dirt might be in your house, it might be in your food. Regardless, it's usually thought of as a bad thing. Soil is what we use to refer to the rich, amazing stuff beneath our feet. It's full of living things like plants, non-living things like rocks and minerals, and it's pretty much essential to all life on Earth. Think about what these plants grow in, what animals like to live in, what we plant our crops in, what we make mud pies in, we really couldn't have life on earth the way we do if not for healthy soil. So that's the word we're going to use today. What do we have to thank for having such rich soil here in the Illinois River Valley? A lot of it's right behind me, a tall grass prairie. This habitat features flowering plants and grasses that are pretty tall, but what's really remarkable about them are their long roots. If you can picture two or three of the tallest people you know, who's the tallest person you know? All right, take that person, stack them on top of each other several times, and that's as long as the roots of these prairie plants go down in the soil. So thanks to those long roots penetrating our earth, the animals and bacteria that live in there enriching the soil, we have some of the best soil for growing crops probably in the world. The First Nations of Illinois discovered this about the soil and were able to use it to their advantage for growing things. And if you live here in central Illinois, you've probably noticed we have a lot of farm fields around. So thanks to our healthy soil and the tall grass prairie for making that happen. Animals that live beneath the soil are actually still here, right at the top level of the earth. Um, if we're talking about an onion, that's just the skin of an onion, a really thin layer. The whole interior of the earth is hot, it's dense, it's full of magma, and it's pretty inhospitable to life. When we think about underground animals, they all kind of have a similar set of adaptations, behaviors or physical parts of their body that they can rely on to survive in their environment. Adaptations of underground animals often include things like having long, thin bodies. Think of an earthworm, maybe having smaller limbs or maybe no limbs at all. Um, one limb that might help you out is having big claws for digging and burrowing into the soil. Underground animals tend not to have very complicated eyes and their eyes are actually pretty small and not nearly as good as our eyes. Think about where they live. It's pretty dark down there, so having a large part of your brain devoted to eyesight isn't really necessary. They don't have usually external ears, so none of these sticking out, um, but they might have other good senses to compensate, like a really strong sense of smell. So let's pretend we're underground animals. Close your eyes almost all the way, but still allowing a little light underneath. Cover your ears so you have a reduced sense of hearing and scratch at the ground with your feet like you're digging in the soil. All right, change back into your normal human selves, but now you got a preview of what life is like as an underground animal. So think about all those adaptations that I just mentioned. I want you to take a moment, get a piece of paper and some drawing material and see if you can draw an animal, real, or imaginary that contains some of those adaptations that I just mentioned for life under the soil. Ready? Pause. Okay, now 
I want to see these amazing, weird underground animals that you've created. So if you can have a grown up take a picture of your animal, post it to their favorite social media site with the hashtag underground adventures, we can find it and create a gallery of all these impressive underground creatures. Well, you might be asking yourself, what are some of the benefits of living underground? A lot of it has to do with avoiding predators, the animals that might want to eat you. If you can safely hang out underground, like a little chipmunk, you'll be safe when a hawk comes soaring by looking for a snack. If you are Chuck here and a hungry coyote comes prowling through, if you have an underground burrow you can head to, you're less likely to be lunch for that coyote. Underground animals can also take advantage of that environment by using it to hibernate, a thing that a lot of mammals and in Illinois, all reptiles, amphibians, and other cold-blooded creatures have to do. Finally, a lot of animals will go underground to lay their eggs and protect those delicate life stages from things that might want to eat them. You might also enjoy being underground if it's really hot, cold, or stormy outside. If we are experiencing extreme weather, life underground tends to be a little, well, less extreme. Think about if you have ever been around during a tornado warning, where do you usually go? If you have a basement or some kind of underground space, you'll often go there. If you don't, you might go to a bathroom, a closet, someplace without windows that kind of feels like a cozy underground space. If you're a worm, a snail, a slug living under the soil, things can actually get too wet down there. Have you ever seen after a big rain, animals like this coming up out of the earth? That's because it can actually get too wet down there for them. And these animals still need to breathe air. They're not like fish. And what might happen when these animals come above ground? That's right. It's possible that they might get eaten by a robin, by a possum, by a skunk. Even my friend Chuck might feel tempted to take a bite. That's why as soon as it's safe to do so, these animals will head back underground and stay there until they have to come up again. Are there any drawbacks to living underground? Is there any time it might not be such a good thing? Well, remember when we talked about the adaptations, these animals often have to make compromises in terms of the size of limbs they can have. You don't see many underground animals with huge long arms and legs. They have reduced eyesight and not a great sense of hearing, right? So while there are great things about being underground and being able to survive, they pay for it a little bit too. Now it's time to meet some groups of animals that spend some of their life underground. One type of animal that you might be familiar with are mammals. So animals like us that have fur or hair somewhere on our bodies that give birth to live babies and that have four limbs on our body, like Chuck and our groundhog friend here, our chipmunk friend here. These animals often will go underground to hibernate. Although some spend their entire lives under the soil, like the humble mole. Now, if you've never seen a mole, don't feel bad because they rarely come above ground. In fact, I've never even seen a live mole. So one thing you'll notice is if you look at this picture, you can barely see their eyes. Their eyes are so small, but they definitely have big claws for digging and a pretty intense nose, which is their main sense for getting around, finding food, and surviving their underground lives. Here is a diagram of the nose of a mole, and you can see it is really complicated. There are 22 individual nose parts, not even counting the nostrils. Not all moles have noses that are this weird and multi-pronged, but all moles are really good at smelling. Then we have our animals that are only underground sometimes. You may have seen groundhogs in real life and you may have seen chipmunks in real life. So we know these animals don't spend their entire lives under the soil. They do this to hibernate during winter. Some mammals will choose to hibernate because being active and trying to find food during winter is really costly in terms of energy. So these animals choose to snooze it out. They're not necessarily sleeping the entire time they're hibernating, but they definitely turn their energy levels 
way down. The place that they hibernate is called a hibernaculum. Some animals migrate um, alone, like a bear. Some hibernate in family groups, like a beaver in its lodge. So if you think about creating a hibernaculum for yourself, what would you want to have in it? Would you want it to be a big one for your whole family or would you want it to be a little one just for you? Usually when animals are creating their hibernaculum, they don't want a lot of extra space in there. It's just big enough to fit their bodies and not much else. That's because the warmth for their hibernaculum comes from their body heat. So the bigger space you have to heat, the more energy you're going to use to heat it using your body. If you were to create a hibernaculum in your house, with permission from your parents or your family members, of course, what would you want to have in it? Would you want it to be just for you or would you want other people to go in there with you? What might you make it out of? What would you want to have in there for when you relax, read, play, whatever it is that you would do during a period of hibernation? Insects and spiders are a group of animals that can't survive our cold Illinois winters, so they either die, migrate, or head under the soil to, to hibernate. When we talk about bugs, that includes a whole bunch of little creepy crawly things. When we talk about insects, usually what we're speaking about are animals that have three body segments, two antennae, and two to four wings coming out of their body, plus six legs. So when we talk about insects, we'll be talking about this specific type of animal. When we talk about other creepy crawly things, we'll call them bugs. You can remember the parts of an insect, the three body segments, by singing a little song about them. They have their head, that's an easy one to remember. We have one too. They have their thorax, the middle segment that has all the wings and legs coming out of it, and their bottom part, their abdomen, which does, well, the same thing our bottom part does. You might know the song, Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, we can't really sing that about an insect because they don't have shoulders or knees or toes. So we can sing it using the body parts that they have. We can sing head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, two antenna and six long legs, head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Okay, now you do it in this time. Don't make me sing by myself. Ready? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Two antenna and six long legs. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Very good. This is a great song to annoy your parents with. And if you want to get creative, you can change the words so they're about a different type of animal you like, not necessarily an insect. Here we have a really interesting insect, a hissing cockroach colony. A colony is a group of animals that live together, usually in a family group. So many of these cockroaches here are related. We do have cockroaches in the wild in Illinois, but none of those species hiss. We use hissing cockroaches to learn about insects because they're easy to study up close, because they're large, and they don't have wings, so they can't fly away from us. I'm gonna get a big one out for us to look at here. So here we have a male hissing cockroach. We can tell he's a male because he kind of has two bumps on the top of his body. Now his head, thorax, and abdomen are actually covered by this outer shell, their carapace. So this guy is doubly protected, which is perfect for an animal that is constantly burrowing under logs, under rocks, under tree bark, to seek protection from all the animals that might like to eat it. You can imagine a big juicy cockroach here is a good sized snack for a lot of wild animals. They also have really flat bodies, which is ideal for fitting into tight underground spaces. One thing that I think is really cool about him are his long, beautiful antennae. So his antennae, if you see them moving every once in a while, means that he's picking up chemicals on those to detect what's going on around him. He does have eyes, um, no ears. He has little tiny jaws that are really only good for eating plant material. As an underground animal, he can eat things like 
bark and leaves and, you know, sticks and roots and a lot of the stuff that other animals don't necessarily want to eat. I bet a leaf sandwich doesn't sound that good to you right now either, but to a cockroach, that's a real treat. So he is a decomposer. He helps out by getting rid of all the buildup of plant material that happens in the forest over time and kind of recycles it back to the earth, contributing a lot of nutrients to the soil. So even though these are kind of weird animals, they're really important in our forest underground environment. Another thing that's cool about him are his spiky legs that he can use to cling to different surfaces. You might be able to see the spikes on his legs as he clings to my thumb. Insects don't always look like these adult hissing cockroaches here. You might know that all insects start out as an egg, hatch into a larva like a caterpillar, and eventually metamorphosize into an adult, like an adult monarch butterfly or a hissing cockroach. If you have ever seen a butterfly chrysalis or a moth cocoon, that's actually an additional life stage that some types of insects have, the pupa. And a lot of times insects will lay their eggs on or under the ground or pupate on or under the ground to protect those delicate life stages from all the bad things that could happen to them, like getting eaten or being destroyed in a storm. In Illinois, all reptiles and amphibians have to hibernate. These are cold-blooded animals that just can't deal with our cold winters. If you were a snake or a turtle that lived in Central America where it's warm year-round, you wouldn't have to hibernate. But that's why when you're here at Forest Park or your other favorite outdoor area, hiking during the winter, you're not gonna come across a big snake. My friend Dash here is a black rat snake. This is the most common species of snake we see on the trails here at Forest Park Nature Center and probably a lot of other forested areas in central Illinois. Dash is about six feet long, but in the wild, you can see black rat snakes that are up to eight or 10 feet long. So she's actually pretty short for her species. A couple of things you might notice about Dash are, first of all, her colors. She's almost pure black, but she has some little specks of brown on there too. So she camouflages very well with the forest floor when she's hunting for small little animals to eat. All snakes are what we call obligate carnivores. That means that they can't survive on just a plant diet. They eat pretty much exclusively other animals. When Dash was young, she might have eaten insects, but now that she's a full grown snake, she likes eating mammals. We feed her mice here in captivity, but in the wild, chipmunks would probably be a big treat for her. And thanks to having no arms or legs, Dash can sneak down a chipmunk burrow pretty effectively without anything to get in the way. Snakes don't make their own burrows, but they'll definitely take advantage of ones made by other animals, especially small mammals. Another interesting feature that you might notice about Dash is that she's always sticking out her tongue. So any animal with a tongue shaped like a Y uses it for smelling. That Y-shaped tongue fits into a special organ in her mouth called the Jacobson's organ, and that processes the chemicals that she's picked up on her tongue and lets the brain know so it can process exactly what she's smelling. She might be trying to figure out right now what exactly she's smelling. I'm probably a familiar smell to her, but if she met a new person, she might be particularly curi curious and doing a lot of tongue flickering. Again, this comes in handy because underground, it's pretty dark. So her sensitive tongue does a really good job at letting her know what's going on and what's food and maybe what's not food. Snakes have predators too, so she needs to be sensitive to an animal like a hawk or a coyote coming by that might want to eat her. My friend E.T. here is an eastern box turtle. In Illinois, we have two types of turtles. We have forest or land turtles like E.T. and we have aquatic turtles, the one that spend a bulk of their time in the water. Land turtles like E.T. have a rounded shell and that shell is actually part of his skeleton. So when he was born, he was a tiny turtle with a tiny shell. 
and as he grew, his shell grows with him. So a turtle never outgrows its shell and it can never take its shell off. On his body, you'll see a couple of neat adaptations. He's got on his feet some pretty good claws that he uses to burrow in the soil. He does this for two reasons. One is when he's burrowing down in the mud to hibernate during the winter. Another reason is that he uses them to dig for things to eat underground. Treats for him include earthworms, millipedes, beetle grubs. He would even eat some seeds and berries and roots that he finds under there. So a turtle is an omnivore like us. In order to have a healthy body and live his full lifespan of up to 100 years, he needs vitamins and minerals from all sorts of different fruits and vegetables. That's why it can be hard to have a turtle or a tortoise as a pet. Meeting their nutritional demands can be kind of challenging. E.T. also has a short stubby little tail toward the end of his body. And that's a thing that's typical for land turtles. Aquatic turtles or water turtles have a pretty long tail that they can use for steering in the water. They would also have webbed feet for swimming as opposed to clawed feet for digging. We have a lot of earthworms in our environment, so he could probably sacrifice one to let E.T. have a little treat. Thing we can find underground that, well, is not actually alive are fossils. Fossils are remnants of something that used to be alive, like a shark tooth, or an imprint of something, like um, a, a plant fossil imprint that you might find. Creek beds in Illinois are fantastic places to look for fossils. Here we have our shark tooth. And here we have an imprint of a plant. Now we don't find a lot of dinosaur fossils here in Illinois. It's just not a great place for it. What we do find are fossils of some plants, but a lot of little marine animals. That's because Illinois used to be covered by a giant ocean. If you are looking for fossils, you can probably find them around you. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a creek bed and you don't necessarily need to be out here in the forest to find them either. Marine animals once lived all around us, even if you are living in a neighborhood or a city and don't have access to a park. So some types of things that we can find here in our state include fossils of animals like crinoids, which were little kind of plant-like animals, but they were related to sea urchins and starfish more than anything else. We can find little shell-dwelling animals like brachiopods. We can find the actual shells and we can find imprints of these animals. And then we might also find plant fossils here. Take a look around and see what you might find. Finding a fossil is a little bit like solving a mystery. First, you have to figure out what kind of animal am I looking at? Once you figure that out, you can start to learn more things about what its life was like. Did it live alone or was it part of a colony? What did it eat? What was its lifespan? Did it have any predators? Scientists at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago ask a lot of these same questions and they have collected and studied thousands of fossils of Illinois plants and invertebrates. You can check out their photo fossil gallery at the link below this video you can explore the underground animals around us here in central Illinois. Here we have a nice log and underneath it are probably some animals that call it home. Think about what they might be. They're probably not huge animals like a bear, which for the record we don't have here in central Illinois. It's probably not something furry like a little chipmunk. Think smaller. Maybe think something with lots of legs or maybe something with no legs. Take a minute and form a hypothesis. That just means a guess or a prediction based on what you already know about underground animals. Think about three different animals that might be living underneath this log. Take a moment and form a hypothesis. What three animals might be under here? 
All right, now it's time to see if you're right. It's also time to see if I'm strong enough to roll this log over. But does it matter if your hypothesis is right? What's going to happen to you if you're wrong? Nothing. It's totally okay if your hypothesis is wrong. It's just a guess after all. And a lot of times scientists like it when their hypotheses are wrong because it means they get to learn something new. And so do we. All right, let's check it out. What do we have under here? Hmm. I see a few roly polies that are actually on top of these leaves. Hmm. A bunch of shells. That tells us that something has been underneath here, but isn't any longer. If we look over on this side of the log, we can see animals that are actually, I think they're hard to find because they're camouflaging really well. A group of snails. I don't know what a group of snails is called. It's not a flock or a pod, but I bet we could figure that out. You can see these ones, unlike the one that was dead, that was only a shell, these ones have both of their antennae sticking out. They have photoreceptors, photoreceptors on the end of each antenna, and that lets a little light in, kind of like an eye. Kind of like a turtle, they have a protective shell that's part of their body. We have a little roly-poly friend crawling around. And here's a weird pupa, look at that. That's a young stage of some type of insect, but I don't recognize what type that is. So it might metamorphosize into some other type of living thing. It's moving a little bit. It would be interesting if you found something like this to kinda put it in a jar and watch it for a few hours, see what happens before you move it back to its natural environment. Over here we have, oh, I thought I saw some earthworms. Yeah, so earthworms are a common thing that you would find if you dig in the soil or living underneath the surface, like a log. So there's actually quite a bit going on under here that we may or may not have realized. There are some little other little animals running the length of this log, like small millipedes, an ant or two. Here's a millipede. Wow, that's a tiny one in there, kind of moving. They're camouflaged well and they're tiny. So, I mean, you have to spend a couple minutes looking under here to be able to find these animals sometimes. They're not always super obvious, but trust me, they're there. Bringing a magnifying glass might also help you see these animals larger than they actually are. All right, so did all three of your guesses appear underneath this log? If so, that's pretty impressive. How about one or two of your guesses? Did we find them under here? There are probably some of you that guessed something that we didn't find at all, right? Which is totally okay. And that's honestly how science works most of the time. What we found under here was our data. That's the new information that we learned that we can now use to say, we know a little bit more about the types of animals that live under this one log here in central Illinois. Now, if I flipped another log, I might find totally different stuff. And then our knowledge increases about what types of underground animals we have in our environment. This is a fun thing for you to try at home if you have a log or a rock to flip over. Just make sure you get permission from the person who actually owns the rock or log, if applicable. And most importantly, don't forget to flip it back over when you're done. These animals here rely on a dark, moist environment to survive, right? And if we leave that log unrolled, they, we've totally changed their environment to a new type of habitat that they might not be able to survive in. Another way we can learn more about the adaptations of underground animals are by playing some sensory games to learn a little bit more about how these animals use their senses. One fun activity is a smell test. I have three identical cotton rounds that I have put a scent on. Mmm. And I'm going to put them in three identical bins. It's really important that everything looks the same because remember, this is a smell test. It's not a vision test. We don't want our brain to be tricked by what we 
see. We are using only our nose. So, Chuck, can you tell me what this smells like? What's that? Flowers? Oh, okay. Flowers. How about this one? Vanilla? Oh, that sounds delicious. I could go for some vanilla right about now. Maybe some vanilla ice cream. And finally, ooh, this is a tricky one. Huh. Fruit? All right. Fruit. Now, groundhogs have really good senses of smell. Humans? A little bit less so. So I would be impressed if whoever you test gets all three of these correct. So what did I use? For our first scent, we had huh, geranium oil. Geranium is a type of flower. For our second scent, we had vanilla extract, something that is great for baking cookies with. And our third scent was lemon juice. So I chose three things that I could pretty easily find around my house. Things like lotions, juices, um, baking oils are things that are pretty easy to find and are also safe to be around. So get creative. See what different scents you can use and see if you can find a person that can correctly identify all three scents. A lot of underground animals also have good senses of touch. Spiders can be really good at this. If you've ever seen a hairy spider, the hairs on that spider's body are not really to keep it warm. It's because they're sensitive and can pick up movements in the air or around it underground. To, set, to test your sense of touch, find a bag that is opaque. That means you can't see through it. You can't see what's inside and put some things in it. But make sure that whatever you put in it isn't gross or sharp or preferably alive, right? And ask somebody to reach their hand inside that bag. Grab something and see if they can figure it out based on feel alone. So what I'm feeling right now is hard, it's bumpy, it's dry, and it's about the size of a grapefruit. I'm going to guess that it is a piece of wood. Let's see if I'm right. Oh, looks like I'm wrong. This is a vertebra or a backbone of some type of mammal. It would be pretty big for a deer. It might be a bigger animal like a horse or a cow. We have a ton of vertebrae in our backbone, all these individual bones that make up our spine. So big animals have huge vertebrae and they have some little ones too. Tiny animals like chipmunks or groundhogs have vertebrae that are pretty much all small, right? This is actually a thing you could find out in nature. If you're taking a hike, you might find a bone of an animal that was once alive, either on the surface of the ground or buried underground, if you dig a little bit. For some other fun activities that explore underground animals, I've given your library staff a worksheet with some fun activities and book suggestions. One of the best ways to learn about nature, other than spending time outside, is to read about it. Your local library staff are experts in finding the things that you want whether it's a book about groundhogs, about underground animals in general, or about something totally else, spaceships, dinosaurs, history, whatever you like to read about, they can help you find it. Finally, I bet you have some good questions and some good stories about underground animals, both from what we talked about today and just your experience being outside and living life. I'd like to invite you to a special Facebook Live session from Forest Park Nature Center on July 23rd at 5 o'clock p.m. I'm going to be bringing a bonus animal that you didn't get to meet in this program. Plus, I want to chat with you and answer any questions that you might have about any of these animals and hear about your adventures learning about underground animals. Those who participate will also be entered to win a family membership to Forest Park Nature Center. So I hope to see you there. Last but not least, I would love to invite you out here to Peoria Park District's Forest Park Nature Center. 
We are a 500 acre nature preserve that is open year round. Our trails are open for hiking from dawn until dusk. Today is May 21st and while our building is currently closed, check our website at www.peoriaparks.org to learn about facility closures and potential reopenings throughout the district. When you're here, we would love for you to enjoy the forests, the hills, the creeks, the tall trees, the forest overlooks, and the wonderful things that nature here in the Illinois River Valley has to offer. Thank you for going on this underground adventure with us, and we hope your summer is full of nature, reading, and everything else that you love.